See, now in the original plan, um, I was gonna go first. <laughs> so Christina totally jacked me up. <laughs> Um, and so I don't know how I'm, gonna, how I'm gonna follow that, but let me just say a few things. This, this is very, very difficult for me. Um, before we get into Rod, Rodney, just in responding to, to Vijay's profound and important um, and moving, moving commentary, one of the things he talks about, um, it re actually I should say, it reminds me of another unpublished book that Versa may consider publishing. And that is, um, W.B. Du Bois wrote a book called Russia and America. And, um, one, and there's a wonderful, there's a wonderful um, chapter about that unpublished text uh, in Vaughn Raspberry's book called Race in a Totalitarian Century, where he, call, he says, what Du Bois argued was that, he talked about the right to, the, 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 the right to fail. And that part of understanding the Soviet experiment is recognizing the right to fail, the right to actually make an attempt and actually fail as part of the transformative process. And that book has never been published because of course everyone thinks it's gonna be an embarrassment to Du Bois, because it's a defense of Stalinism. It, and not so much a defense of all of Stalinism, it's a defense of the Soviet experiment. So I just wanna remind us of that and also say that um, if you're gonna read as an anti-imperialist, make sure you read Red Star Over the Third World. <laughs> Okay, get that book, which I'm actually reviewing it for um, some publication. I'm still working on that, among other things. Um, so let me tell you the story about how I came to this book, because I have a very long history with it. Uh, in 1984, I was a graduate student at UCLA. Sid Lamell was there um, back in those days, my best friend on campus. And um, Ned Alpers, who's a professor of African history, that he was my advisor, because I actually came to UCLA to study African history. Um, I switched fields for various reasons which are not important. But my first job as a research assistant was to work on Walter Rodney's papers. So uh, Pat Rodney, his widow, had you know, fled Guyana, had all his materials, and kind of plopped them in Ned Alpers' office at UCLA. Now keep in mind, this is 1984. This is only four years after his assassination. And I'm, I was a very young graduate student, I should say. I, I finished college very young. Um, I was basically not, like 21 years old, 22 years old, going to graduate school. Uh, and I had this job, and my job was to take these files that were uh, Rodney's lectures on the Russian Revolution. No one knew where they were from or what, when they were actually delivered that came later, um, and basically type them onto what, and young people don't know about this, they used to have floppy disks, okay? And they really were floppy. And I had a computer for the first time, and basically, we didn't have scanners, there were no scanners. So I typed word for word, and edit, and track down citations. And this is very, very important, because there were no footnotes in these lectures. There were about 20 lectures altogether. Some of them were in the form of prose, some of them were just outlines. It was just basically a lot of material, but it was meant to be lectures. And you'd have these like little notations on the side, maybe the, an author or something, and you'd have these long quotes. So I had to track down these quotes in an age when nothing was searchable except going into the library. So I went into the library and read all this Russian history to try to find where he got this material. Um, hundreds of books. I got bronchitis as a result. I remember spending months. And I was working on this, and the idea was to turn these lectures into a book somehow. It was very clear that Rodney had intended to do this because um, among his papers was a handwritten preface that he titled, Two World Views of the Russian Revolutions, Revolution Reflections from Africa. And that was the title that he was working with at the time. Um, what we found out later, you know, in doing research, I'll tell you how we got to later, uh, is that he not only intended to write this book, but it was going to precede how Europe underdeveloped Africa. He was actually in the midst of trying to turn these lectures into the book when he decided, you know what, I need to work on the African material first. And so imagine what it means for those of you who are trying to be professors or whatever that means, uh, to have your PhD, you know, he was 20, 24 years old, he has a job, 
he published his dissertation, and he goes immediately to Russian history. Um, how did he come across this? Well, he was teaching a seminar uh, on historians and revolution. The first, the first semester, uh, and this is at University of Dar es Salaam, was on the French Revolution, the second semester on the Russian Revolution. And he read everything he can get his hands on. So we'll, we'll get to that in a second. So I basically worked, maybe got through maybe a little less than half of the material. Uh, light editing, citations, and that sort of thing. And then Pat left, and she took the papers with her. And that was the end of that. And I had a copy of the, of the manuscript I was working with for years. And I remember giving one copy to Rupert Lewis. Uh, this is back in the days before you had, like, again, nothing was digital. So you actually made photocopies, and you'd like, send them to people. So Rupert Lewis had a copy, and then Dave Rodiger had a copy. I gave it to him years later, and I lost my copy. So fast forward, um, the Rodney family had found uh, what was essentially my annotated versions and edited versions of the lectures, and they thought they were Rodney's. And it wasn't clear you know, what, who did the footnotes, and I said, like, I did the footnotes. You know? <laughs> And so we got into a conversation years later, and as a result of that, which the details are not that important, we all collaborated on, on trying to get this book done, uh, which took a lot of time and a lot of energy. And Vijay was very uh, fundamental in terms of making the connection to Verso, in terms of giving us encouragement to get this thing published. Um, and I remember sending him some of the raw uh, uh, lectures and, and having a conversation about it. So that was very, very important for him. So let me just say a couple things about the context for this. Um, there's the context for me, and there's a the context for Rodney. So the context for me is this is 19, I mean, you talk about assassinations. This is 1984. Maurice Bishop was assassinated in 1983. The New Jewel movement had been crushed. This was the hope for my generation in terms of what socialism could look like, right? This is the invasion of Grenada. Um, and keep in mind that in 1984, this was before uh, Gorbachev, before the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, you know, this was a time when many of us, myself included, were in Marxist-Leninist organizations, okay? And I was very active in one. I won't even name it, though you could look it up. Um, and we're all having these struggles, different line struggles. Um, and we actually believed, and many of us still believe, in the mid-1980s that we were on the winning side. No one imagined what was going to happen in terms of the collapse of the Soviet bloc. We thought we were on the winning side. Not to say that we identify with the Soviet bloc, but that, that Marxism, socialism was, was on the winning side. This was also the ramping up of the Cold War under Reagan. This is also the period where the evidence that we were winning didn't come from Europe, it came from Africa. It came from the Caribbean, right? That's the evidence. South Africa was the evidence that we were winning, okay? So even after the fall of the Soviet Union, we still thought we were winning. Um, I'm gonna skip over um, the Bible. I'm gonna say a few things about the book and the way the book's organized. Um, so Rodney's objectives in doing this book was Manyfold. One, he wanted to introduce students, uh, readers, uh, and students in his class to historical materialism as a methodology for interpreting revolutionary movements. Uh, he had a lot of the book is critiques of bourgeois historians, assessments and critiques of Soviet historians, and then assessments and critiques of those independent Marxist historians, people uh, like Maurice Dobb and others and people like E.H. Carr as a, a left liberal, uh, and trying to figure out like what is, you know, he, he was critiquing bourgeois historians and the liberal conceits of objectivity. So there's a lot of humor in the book. Um, and, and Rodney, if you read How Europe and the Developed Africa, you know he's very funny. Mm -hmm. And he has biting, biting, biting humor and criticisms um, of those bourgeois historians. And so he's also looking at all this <coughs> Um, in their interpretations post-1956. <coughs> Hold on one second. So he's trying to reread the material <coughs> and draw lessons for the third world, which is why, again, the subtitle is actually very, very important. The lectures were not so much about 1917, <coughs> but rather takes a very long view 
He devotes a lot of space to the formation of the Russian Empire and its unique form of settler colonialism, because he saw, um, as, as Vijay was saying, there are multiple fronts of struggle, and one of those fronts is an anti-imperialist struggle within the Russian Empire as one of the sources of what becomes 1917. He looks at issues of the subordination of uh, settler colonialism to, to foreign capital. <coughs> I know I got, um, I'm sick. So, okay. He talks about the rise of the Russian left intelligentsia, the Narodnik uh, movement, the 1905 revolution, um, the events in 1917, he asked, really pointed questions about the inevitability of the revolution. Uh, he makes a distinction between the February and the October revolutions. The February is a bourgeois revolution, October is proletarian. He defends Lenin's decision to dissolve the Constituent Assembly. He looks with a critical eye at Lenin's new economic policy, um, the rise of Stalinism, and, um, and the arguments about socialism in one country. In some ways, he's very critical of Trotsky. In other ways, he does praise him as being really a premier historian in terms of capturing certain elements, particularly when Trotsky and Lenin are on the same page. Um, and he talks about the collectivization of agriculture, which is a very important issue because, of course, what is he dealing with uh, in Tanzania? He's dealing with what it means to transform a, a backwards empire, in the case of, of Russia, into a social state. What does it mean to transform a backward former colony into a modern African social state? That is, how to deal with the peasantry. Um, what does it mean to create the Ujamaa villages? What is required? Where's the role of violence and coercion in this? And he does, just to be clear, um, on the question of violence and coercion, he makes a distinction between the social violence necessary to overthrow a regime, but then argues that um, social violence should not be necessary in order to create transformation. In other words, the state shouldn't use violence in order to force people to do things that, they, that, that are necessary for transformation. There are other forms of, of pressure. So these are the things he talks about. Um, and I don't want to go on too long, but I want to say a few things uh, about, about the significance of the book for now, but also I'm, I'm a little bit wary of reading too much into this book as the, um, the blueprint for the next movement. Mm -hmm. We have a tendency to take these amazing historical documents and take them out of their context. And that's kind of undialectical thinking. To think dialectically is to understand what is his context. Why was he so ferociously anti-imperialist? What was that about? And to understand that, that's why I really want to emphasize in the last remarks I want to make, because we sometimes tend to overlook the things that are problematic about his analysis, and when we don't overlook them, we dismiss it. And so the things that we may disagree with his analysis um, doesn't mean it's not really valuable to understand. On the contrary, it's incredibly valuable to understand and appropriate in this time, place, condition. But if we, so we can't do both those things. And I totally agree with, with um, what Vijay says. Um, part of the, the, the whole, year-long reassessment of the Soviet Union in, the in 1917 has been a way of distancing themselves from the revolution, a way of making this distance without actually understanding what were the constraints they were up against. In other words, the right to fail. Mm. So I, wanna, I want us to be mindful of that and also be mindful of the fact that imagine what it meant to write this book uh, in Dar es Salaam. You pretty much did all the research in about a year maybe a year and a half. Um, of course, he'd been reading on the Russian Revolution for a long time, but it's in the, course of, in the, in the, in the context of teaching his course. But he, what did he have access to? He had access to the libraries at, US, at the University of Dar es Salaam. He did not have access to the Soviet archives. They were not available. He didn't have access to all the scholarship that was produced after the fact. A whole um, uh, a cottage industry of, of books and articles that came out. He had a very limited access, and despite that, he did much like what Du Bois did with Black Reconstruction. Black, Re Black Reconstruction, Du Bois only had limited access to materials and wrote this mag magnificent book. His point wasn't to reconstruct the history, but to rethink 
it's pro the production of that history and its political meaning. So in other words, um, I think there are valuable lessons about where the left was in the 1970s, and not just the left, the third world left, and to recognize the limits of imagination in that time, place, and condition. In other words, we could learn uh, you know, what old ideas need to be abandoned. I'll give you some examples. Keep in mind that when he gave those lectures, like 1971, 7071 was when he taught the course. This was only three, four years after the 50th anniversary of the Russian Revolution of 1917. The political winds were shifting toward Marxism and Leninism. Now, if you think that we thought we we're gonna win in 1984, for damn sure they thought they're gonna win in 1970, because that's what it looked like. I dare anyone to go back in time and stand there and see what it looks like. Capitalists are losing in 1970. The whole world is in crisis. It's socialists that are winning. They're on the winning side. So imagine, the question of the socialist path wasn't settled in Africa, but it was the winning position in Mozambique, in Guinea-Bissau, in Angola, in South Africa, in Zimbabwe, in the People's Republic of the Congo, in the Western Sahara. You can go on and on and on in, in Ethiopia. We could talk, not to mention Vietnam. Um, we also had the Chinese Cultural Revolution. Uh, in the midst of you know, the, the last vestiges of that is taking place as he's beginning this project. Um, China's African interventions along with the Soviets um, and closer to home, Tanzania's own socialist path. And one of the things we talk, that I talk about in, in the introduction is there's a sharp distinction between C.L.R. James's position and Rodney's position. And I go into details about that. We could do that in discussion. But one of the explanations for that difference and one of the reasons why um, Rodney is actually far more um, sympathetic, not to Stalin the person, but to the regime, is because he's actually in a country trying to build socialism mm -hmm. under constraints that were enormous. Versus James, who's, look, I love James. He is, he's, he's never had that experience of being in a country trying to build socialism. He would visit, but it's not the same thing. So what are some of the limitations? Well, one of the limitations uh, for the left in that period, and Rodney is a product of that, is uh, a focus on producerism. Producerism, that is, that's one of the things that the socialist um, ideologues and the Keynesian state had in, po in common, except producerism for different things. Um, Rodney was impressed with the Soviet economy and its emphasis on growth, mm -hmm. investment, rising incomes, its focus on heavy industry, its ability to avoid periodic crises and depressions, right? And that made perfect, perfect sense. We, today, we could talk about um, the, the, the challenges to things like rapid mass production, speed ups, alienation caused by division of labor, the stuff that young Marx was interested in. We could talk about the environment and ecological damage, but when you're standing in 1970 or 71, production is the way to solve the problem of poverty, to solve the problem of want, okay? Um, but in this era of neocolonialism, of dependency, of global poverty, he makes a very strong case for the command economy's role in solving, uh, not just solving, but maintaining a humane standard of living. And for him, this is a critical lesson for the colonized world. So who is he resisting? He's resisting bourgeois historians and economists who claim that Soviet planning slows growth, suppresses scientific developments, reduces worker productivity, and produces little more than a miseration of the masses. And he's saying, but that's not really the case. Again, we could step back here in 2018 and talk about all the things that are problem problematic about producerism, but in that context, there's a certain logic to it. So finally, there's important, important things we could think about today. Can we speak of socialist revolution anymore? What does that look like? Well, we, we're living in a world where socialist revolution is supposed to be Bernie Sanders. I mean, really? <laughs> That's a very different way of thinking about this. So you think, well, what are the models? The former socialist countries, uh, you know, many of them have become models of neoliberalism, um, except for maybe Cuba, and that looks like it's about to change. The Bolivarian revolutions came very close, but they also, you know, would left social democratic experiments, often with weak democratic foundations that are really struggling in this world uh, that's hostile to them. Um, he also reminds us of the importance of revolution. And I mean revolution, really revolution, because this is, it's, it's ironic. 
and I, I've never read this anywhere, and I'm sure people have written it, but there seems to be a kind of unstated acceptance, at least in the US and in the West, of what we used to call Bernsteinism mm -hmm. or Kautskyism. That is, the notion that socialism can be voted through, uh, voted in or through constitutional parliamentary means. And it reminds us that making revolution is more than having self-proclaimed socialists dominating legislative chambers. That it really is about a transformation and that there's, uh, there's a cost to that and we have to, to do that. Um, so uh, if you indulge me, I just wanna end by just reading one paragraph from this because I think it, it from the introduction, because it sort of speaks to what um, I think Rodney was trying to do. Let's see. Um, so the point, as I write, the point of this book is not to write socialism's epitaph, nor to reminisce in the glory of October. To study the Russian Revolution, Rodney insists, is not to emulate it. There are lessons to be learned, and the principle of socialism must be defended, but African and third world revolutionaries cannot slavishly adopt it as a model. Or as Rupert Lewis put it, the most important aspect of Rodney's approach to the Russian Revolution was that its experience and lessons could not be mechanically applied to the African continent. Third world revolutionaries need Marxism, but Rodney wisely counsels that we need to be wary of either Marxist, of a Marxist view through a distorted bourgeois lens or the Soviet view, despite being very close because of the similarity of our present and past with their past in the period under study. He ends on a profoundly reflective note, and he writes, Assuming a view springing from some socialist variant is not necessarily Marxist, but anti-capitalist, assuming a view that is at least radical humanist, then the Soviet Revolution of 1917 and the sub subsequent construction of socialism emerges as a very positive historical experience from which we ourselves can derive a great deal as we move to confront similar problems. So I'll stop there and we can have a conversation. Thank you. Thanks.